Welcome back. I'm Randy Wong. I'm a retina specialist in Northern Virginia. This is a case of a 47-year-old male who's had floaters and blurry vision, especially in the right eye, for many years. What you're going to see in this video is a substantial or mammoth floater. There you see it right there. And uh, later on, I'll show you how I induced a PVD. This is one of the largest floaters I've seen or vitreous opacities I've seen. And what's significant is not so much as the size of the opaque floater or white floater in the vitreous, but really take note as to the size of the shadow on the retina. And this directly obscures his vision, both at distance, near, and all his activities, working on the computer, reading, driving, being out in the outdoors. The sides of this floater actually caused a lot of glare. And so that when he was out on a snowy day or on a bright sunny day, this opacity which at, would actually diffract light inside his eye and really cause a lot of glare, making uh, this opacity really uh, disabling. So he suffered th for this for, with, for many, many years. Uh, this is his right eye. He has similar findings and complaints in his left eye. But this is the surgery we did the other day. It was a 25 gauge vitrectomy at Woodburn Surgical Center. We did it as an outpatient. And you can see that worm-like piece that's just kind of being eaten up uh, by the uh, micro vitrector. There's a small opening at the end of that, of the micro vitrector, which basically aspirates or sucks and grafts vitreous very, very quickly in tiny, tiny little chunks. So it makes it almost impossible for me to uh, grab onto the uh, vitreous and pull on the retina makes it very difficult to create a retinal tear. Once the central vitreous or vitrectomy is completed, and you can see that because the large opacity is gone, and also notice the large shadows from the opacity disappear as well. So right now, all we can really see is the shadow from the vitrectomy instrument as I'm reaching across the eye to try and remove some of the more peripheral vitreous or vitreous over to the side. Now we're gonna start to inject the Kenalog uh, which is that white powdery substance and there's nothing nothing special about the medicinal quality or attributes of this other than the fact it's a suspension that is it's not a liquid it's not dissolved and this powdery suspension uh, kind of sticks to vitreous so it helps me see uh, vitreous very easily once I start removing uh, and creating some turbulence in there the powdery substance gets mixed up but in just a moment, you're going to be able to see, kind of like dusting for fingerprints, you're going to see a light powdery outline of the vitreous that's still adherent to the surface of the retina. Now, I shared with uh, my patient and his family that at this point, I was so somewhat surprised that there was still vitreous, although preoperatively, I couldn't tell for sure if there was a PVD. I was glad I did this extra step to ensure that there were to basically determine whether or not there was residual uh, vitreous and certainly uh, there is as you'll see and he did not have a PVD uh, at the time of um, the preoperative exam. So I'm moving, removing the excess Kenalog or triessence. I can never get the amount just right. I always inject a little bit too much and a little bit too much is about 0.1 of a cc. So now I'm just trying to create some general suction on the posterior portion of the vitreous. And this is quite easy to pull up in this case because he is 47 years old. He's probably getting ready to naturally have a PVD anyway. So the adhesions between the posterior vitreous and the surface of the retina uh, are probably much weaker compared to, a, say, a 20-year-old. But this demonstrates nicely how the posterior vitreous or the back half of the vitreous gets separated from the surface of the retina. And what I'm trying to show you here on the sides or the periphery is you can actually see the vitreous separating from the posterior retina and my goal is to to advance this separation at least to the the equator allowing the posterior vitreous to move forward because it's no longer attached to the back half of the eye including the optic nerve and this allows me to more efficiently and quickly uh, remove most of the vitreous, at least most if not all of the posterior vitreous. Now the goal at this point is once I've created a PVD and I'm removing 
the rest of the posterior vitreous, the goal really is how much to the periphery can I safely remove uh, to avoid frill or residual vitreous. So I'm going to painstakingly go around the peripheral retina in a circumferential fashion or a circular fashion, trying to get mo most of the peripheral, as much of the peripheral vitreous as I can. And you can see that there's still some uh, canalog mixed in with that, or triessence. And that extra wispiness is, you can see the copious amounts of vitreous that are actually freed up when causing a PVD. The vitrectomy instrument is in the anterior vitreous and all the, uh, or the anterior portion of the uh, uh, vitreous cavity and all the vitreous is actually coming up towards me and that's why I don't have to move my instruments that close to the uh, surface of the retina. I hope you enjoyed this vid video of a 47 year old male with a substantial floater and how I induced a PVD. I'm Randall Wong. I'm a retina specialist located in Fairfax, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. in the United States. A special thanks to my talented staff at Woodburn Surgical Center. Special thanks to Brooklyn Duo for their background music. If you care to, please leave a comment or email me, uh, and I'll do my best to answer your questions or concerns. Please follow us at www.retinaeyedoctor.com or www.vitrectomyforfloaters.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks for viewing. Bye-bye.